testify in court often as part of your job? No. So are you a little bit nervous this morning? Thank you. Okay, and that's okay. Um, and you are the person who took uh, 3D images of some of the ballistics evidence in this case, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, what do you currently do for a living? I'm a data entry specialist for uh, ultra forensic technology. And where is that located? In Montreal, Canada. Um, and was that your job on June 10th of 2015? Yes. Um, and what kind of company is Forensic Technology? Um, forensic Technology is a company that develops and designs software and usage with powerful microscopes and cameras um, to create forensic tools for firearms examiners. And as part of your day-to-day -day job, do you take images of bullets? Yes, of bullets and cartridge cases. Um, and what um, kind of equipment do you use to take images of bullets? Uh, bu the bullet track system. And what is that? The bullet track system is a computer with the use of a confocal microscope and a camera um, and motorized equipment that takes di digital uh, images, 2D, 3D images of the surface of the bullets. And does it have some kind of holder for the bullet? Yes, a bullet holder. Um, and it takes, the bullet track system takes microscopic images? Yes, sir, it does. Um, when, you take, when you take a photograph of a bullet, or when you acquire a bullet into the system, how many photographs does the bullet track system take? Oh, uh, multiple, but I am unknown. It's, it's the entire surface of the base of the bullet. And are those images then used to create a 3D image of the bullet? I'd ask you to change the form of the question. What are those um, images uh, used to um, assemble after you've compiled, after the bullet track system has taken all those images? Okay, what repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of image do the, do the 2D images that you take, um, what, when they're assembled, what do they create? They create a mosaic. What does that mean? A mosaic. It's an entire circumference of the base of the bullet looks kind of like an onion ring. And does it create 3D images? Yes, yes. Um, can you describe briefly the process of acquiring a bullet into the bullet track system? Sure, uh, briefly you would go into the system, initialize it, uh, you would create a case and within that case you would create an exhibit. After that you would mount your bullet you would put it on the, uh, the bullet stub, you would put that on the bullet holder, and then you would place that into the system, and then you would click on the exhibit number, the case and exhibit number that you created in the system. You would ensure that the bullet surface was underneath the camera's eye in position, and then click the continue button, and you just let the system go until it's finished. And so do you take the separate images manually, or does the system automatically take the multiple images? The system does that. I, I do not interfere. And about how long does it take to acquire a single bullet? It's fair to say uh, uh, 20 minutes, approximately 20 minutes. Um, and how many bullets can be acquired by the bullet track system at one time? One at a time. Um, and does the machine capture images of the bullet in a digital format? Yes, it's digital. And, and where are those files uh, stored? In the data concentrator. Okay. And that is uh, separate from your workstation computer, yes. is that right? Yes. Sustained. Is that separate from the work, workstation that you yes. work on? Yes. Yes. Um, did you meet uh, Detective Jeff Stone, the investigator in this case, at some point? Only on June 10th was the first time I met him. June 10th of what year? 2015. Um, and where did you meet with Jeff Stone? At my office in, in Montreal. Um, and did Detective Jeff Stone bring something with him to the lab? Yes, he brought uh, exhibits to be uh, uh, acquired into the system. The request was um, just for the images. May I approach you, Yes. I'm handing you uh, what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 54. 
55 and 53B? Yes. Do those resemble, are those the um, bullets and the, are those the bullets that uh, Detective Jeff Stone brought with him to your meeting? Sustain. Um, do you recognize those? Yes, I bullets? do. Again, there's one missing. Okay, and what, which one is missing? It's a very small, clear bag with a very tiny fragment type in it. Okay, and aside from, from the, the bag with the fragment in it, um, do you recognize those envelopes and baggies as being what Jeff Stone brought with you, brought yes. with him to the meeting with you? Yes, I do. Um, and what did uh, Detective Stone do with the baggies and envelopes that he brought with him to the lab? Uh, he maintained complete custody of it. He, when it was time for me to acquire a bullet into the system, he would hand it to me. I never touched it. And how many uh, envelopes did he open at a time? Only one. Okay. Um, and what did uh, Detective Stone do when he opened the first envelope? He identified it for me. Um, the first two that I entered in the system was Exhibit 3 and Exhibit 4, but one at a time. Um, and what did he do with the bullet when he pulled it out of the, the bag? He would hand it to me. Then I would mount it on the bullet stub. I would put that in the bullet holder. I would put that into the machine. And again, the process would start for the acquisition. And for the first bullet that you acquired, um, did you enter information about the bullet into the computer? Yes. Um, and did the bullet have a case number in your system? Uh, Detective Stone and I would have had a conversation. I would have asked him, what case number do I put? Because when you open a case, you have to have a case number. And what was the case number for the first bullet? You know, sir, I don't re remember. I know that it was number one, but this is his name, Stone, in a series of numbers. So, um, so the, the first bullet that you acquired into the system that day, what, do you remember what bullet number that was? That was exhibit number three. And that's bullet number three, right? Yes. Um, and do you remember now what case number that was? No, it, I, it would go in case number one. Okay. The series of numbers before that, I have no clue. Okay. Um, and did you identify that bullet as bullet number three in the computer software? Yes, I did. Um, and what did you do after you entered the information about the bullet into the system and had acquired the images? The first one? Yes. After I acquired it, well, I would give the bullet back to the detective, and then he would give me the next bullet to enter into the system. Um, after you handed the bullet back to Jeff Stone, what did he do? He would with put the, that, with that bullet. He would put that back in the evidence bag. Okay, and did you seal it up? Only after the second one was acquired, because okay. there were two test fires per bag. Okay. Um, and so it was your understanding then that bullet number three was a test fire. Was bullet number three a test fire? Yes. Um, and how many additional test fired bullets after bullet number three did you acquire into the system? For that particular bag, one more. The okay. second bag, there would have been two other test fires. And how many were there total test and fires? Four test fires. Um, and did you enter information about those additional three test fires after bullet number three into the system? Uh, the second one, when I entered the case number one, because Jeff Stone told me it was exhibit three and four, I entered case the case one, and I closed it. I entered case I made case two and closed it. That's when he gave me bullet number three. I entered it into the system under the case one under exhibit three. When that was done, I gave it back to the detective. He then handed me bullet number two. I entered that into case two, exhibit four, okay? And you said bullet number two. I meant, sorry, bullet number three in case two, exhibit four. Okay. Um, were all the bullets that uh, Mr. Stone handed you identified with some kind of number? No. The first package that he opened up, they were engraved on the base of the bullet, exhibit three and exhibit four. 
On the second package, there was no engraving and no identification. So I gave Detective Stone a black marker and I said, you must identify the exhibits that you want me to acquire. And did he do that? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, and did the exhibit numbers in the computer system for bullets, or for exhibits one, two, three, and four, did those match the numbers that you used to identify the bullets in the system? Repeat that. Yes, I'm sorry, that was a bad question. Um, did, the, did the bullet numbers that Jeff Stone used to identify the bullets, did those match the exhibit numbers that you put into the computer yes. system? Yes. Um, and did uh, Detective Stone hand you a fifth bullet? Yes. Um, and what was the fifth bullet contained in? It was contained in a manila envelope. And you're um, pointing to exhibit? This one, yes. What exhibit number is that? Uh, 53B. Thank you. Um, was that bullet identified with the number? And uh, Not on it. It's a, it was a a fragment, the shell of, uh, of the bullet. It was the number that I had seen somewhere on the bag. Okay, do you remember what that number was? Uh, item 24, and I would have spoken to Stone. And um, what did you do with that bullet? Um, again, I would have taken the bullet and mounted it on the bullet stub and put it on the bullet holder and then placed it into the system and then the acquisition. And did you use an exhibit number to identify that bullet from the computer program? Yes, I used the exhibit, the number I saw, number 24, item 24. Okay. Um, and what did you do after the information about that bullet had been entered into the computer and the images had been acquired? I gave it back to Detective Stone. And he it put it in the envelope and he sealed it. Okay. With tape. Um, after you had entered all this information about the five bullets, did you ever go back and edit any of the information that you put into the computer? Yes, because in the case ID and also within the exhibit uh, case, there are comment fields that you could add pertaining to the case itself. You can add the detective's name. Uh, you can add uh, further information regarding what it was that you have done. And in, that, in these instances, I made typos. I made typos in Jeff's name because I did not know how he spelled it. I spelled it J-E-F-F. -F. He spells his name G-E-O-F-F. -F. Right. So I corrected. And there are still typos in the word detective. I think I can forgive you for that. Thank but, you. <laughs> um, when you entered the information into the system, did you manually enter the time that you acquired the images? No, 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 no. That's all generated by the computers. Um, and since the images were captured, did you notice, or had, has it come to your attention that there were any errors in the timestamps? After I first spoke with Attorney Bregman, he's the one who noticed that there was a timestamp error in the, on the reports. Uh, they were saying that they were approximately four hours ahead of time than what I had originally inquired them. When you say uh, Attorney Bregman, are you referring to Mr. Sam Bregman? Yes, I don't know who he is. Okay, do you, okay. And you spoke to him over the phone? He, uh, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, was the computer that you were using to operate the camera accurate in its time? I'm sorry. Was the, the, your workstation computer, yes. was that accurate in its time? Yeah. yeah. What about? concentrator where the images were stored? No, it was okay. not accurate. Um, other than the timestamp and the typos, have any other errors come to your attention about the information that you entered into the system? No. Um, and if you had incorrectly entered an exhibit number, would there be a way for somebody to find out? Yes. If there had been an error made? Yes. How would they find that out? Uh, you would have to contact the company and ask them for an audit log. Um, and were you asked to do any kind of analysis on these no. images? No, the request was just to take pictures of the surface of the base of bullets, and that was it. Did you know anything about this case at the time that you acquired the bullets? No. Um, and did you create these images for a qualified ballistics examiner? Yes, Mr. Rocky Edwards. Okay. Thank you. Can I have a moment to confer your honor? Sure.
And Ms. Desrosiers, do you know where the images were sent after you acquired them? Um, this one of the senior scientists, Danny Roberge, he compiled all the images and he sent them to Rocky Edwards okay. via the internet. Via the internet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No further questions. Thank you. Any questions? Can you say your last name for me so if I say it, I get it right? De Rosier. I won't. <laughs> De, De Rose E A. De is right. Okay. Thank you. It's nice to meet you in person. And you are? Sam Brightman. Pleasure. So, um, you recall that we, we had an interview over the phone, right? Yes. Yes, okay. And you recall that I was back in July of 2015, right? Uh, I don't recall the exact date, but yeah. Does that sound about right? It sounds about right. Okay. And would you agree with me that that was a lot closer in time to when you actually did the work in this case? Yes. Okay. And at the time you told me that there were two bullet bags that were presented to you when, you, when Mr. Stone first got there, right? Uh, yeah, he, he showed them. He had them in his hand. Right. And, and when, you, when we talked, you couldn't distinguish between the two bags, could you? No. Okay, there was, there was nothing that you recall that there was a difference between the two bags, right? I wasn't paying attention to them, yeah. Right. And you didn't take a picture of the two bags, did you? No, it, 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 there was no analysis requested. It was just to take right. pictures. In fact, you don't know where these bullets, which bullets went with which gun, do you? No. Okay. And... Um, you didn't take any notes specifically no. of this, did you? No, it was just to take images. Right. right. Okay. And when you um, when you originally got these, the, the first bullets, for example, from from uh, Detective Stone, you had told me that none of the bullets were marked, right? Yes, I hadn't. I could not remember. I have never testified before. I was so nervous. Right. Well, you told me at the time though that none of the bullets had been marked, right? Well, two of the bullets hadn't been marked, but at the time I did tell you that, but I could not remember correctly. Well, let me understand how you've now remembered that two of the bullets were marked. Is it because you've had a chance to talk with the prosecution, these lawyers? Um, no, actually, when I came out here for the first preliminary re uh -huh. uh, hearing, uh -huh. I had been sitting in the airport with a terrible flight to come out here. Okay. Nervous, upset. Uh -huh. When I spoke to Detective Stone, because he was going to be picking me up at the airport, I said, uh, he asked me how I was doing, and I said, I'm doing terrible. I don't understand anything. It doesn't make sense. I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders, that something was wrong, because I couldn't understand what had happened when we, you and I, had spoke right. regarding the case report. And he asked me specifically, and he said, and I told him I couldn't understand the bullets, the order of the bullets. And he said, Debbie, don't you remember? And I said, I don't remember anything. I'm so nervous. So then he told you? Yes. He said the first two were marked. And I said, oh, that makes so much more sense. Things. So, so now you've, you've basically, you'd agree with me that, that your answer was different back closer in time, right? Yes. And now you've changed your answer because Detective Stone has told you, don't you remember those two were marked, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Because um, they were engraved, the first two set of test fires. I see. Okay. But in all your other experience with all, you've worked with detectives before that have come through, right? A few. And I think you told me on the day that we did the interview, didn't you, that in all your other experiences, those bullets are always marked, all of them, right? Well, yes. And this was odd to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you, you, you made a point of having him mark them, right? Well, in order to enter them into the, case, into the system, they have to be identified. Okay. okay. Um, actually, you actually get a, a sheet print out of this, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's actually, for every bullet that you test, there's actually a sheet that comes out? No. No, you request a sheet. This was the first time I ever printed a sheet in That's, my entire career. So we've talked about those sheets in okay. the interview, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay. And you would agree with me, oh, and by the way, you agree with me that Detective Stone sat with you the entire time you entered these? Mm-hmm. 
Is that a yes for the record? Yes. Okay. And during that time you said that there was, today you said that each one was about 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, so there was five that you did? Yes. Okay, so um, about a, an hour and 40 minutes it took to do these then, if you just kept doing them right after the other? Is that I did the first four okay. before lunch. Okay. After lunch, I did the fifth one. Okay. And would you agree with me that the... the in order for your images and your input to be correct, the, the computer has to be functioning appropriately, are you right? Yeah. And the, you said you said to me in our interview that you didn't know if the timestamp was working correctly or not. That was pure speculation. Yes. Right? Yes, it was. And then you went back and checked it, is that right? The company went back and checked it. And it wasn't working accurately? That's correct. Okay. Um, what else did they check to see if it was working accurately? Uh, the the system itself to make sure that it was working accurately. I see. And you actually went back and modified some stuff after Detective Stone left, didn't you? Remember we talked about that in the interview? I would have to go through and look at the time. Okay, do you remember? Do you have those same images that we talked about over the phone? Did you bring them with you? No. Have you, have you been shown those by the prosecution in the last 24 hours? No. Did they even ask you about the images? No. Okay. So, so, to, be, so to be clear, the, the actual, you have the ability to print out the work that you, were, you did, right? Yes. And you'd agree with me that some of the input data that you put in was not correct, right? Right. There were typos. Right. And when, when tell, the, tell, the, tell the court everything that you have to put into the computer that you put in. You put in the case number, is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, I'm sorry. I, well, I'm sorry. It's just that she's taking down everything, so we have to have a verbal response. So you take down the case number. You take down the type of rifle? The rifle. Well, back up, sir. The case ID. The case ID number. It's the first dialog box that comes in. They shows right. up when you enter a new case. You do put you, the case ID. Do you put down what type, at any time, do you put down what type of gun it is, is used or no? That can be put in if you know in the exhibit, okay. when you create the exhibit. Did you put that in when you created the exhibit? The gun type? No, I don't have a gun type. I don't know the firearm. You don't know which gun any of these guns? No. Okay. And did you put the type of bullet in? The type of bullet. The type of bullet would be referring to, are you referring to caliber or to the crime? You tell me, did you put either one of them in? Of course I put the caliber in, okay. in the crime. Okay. Some of us aren't familiar with your program. That's it's, it's okay. Okay. So you put those in, and that's all information that you put in, right? Right. Okay. And that information has to be correct, right? Well, yeah. If it's not correct, then, then everything about what you're doing is not going to be reliable, right? If you're not putting the right caliber, for example, or something like that, right? If it was going to be uh, correlated. I am not hooked up to a correlated service, uh, server. I work in a research department. We're not a laboratory services. Right. So, so, but it's important that people are able to rely on the information that you yes. put in, correct? Yes. <laughs> and would you agree with me that your, those images or those, um, not the images, but those, those documents that are, that are produced from your work, those documents were modified after Mr. Stone left, weren't they? I would have to check the date stamp and the log book when he signed out of the building. Okay. Would you agree with me? Let me see if I can refresh your memory. Would you agree with me that we talked about Exhibit 3 in our interview? Can you recall that? Vaguely, yes. Okay. Um, I asked, see if you remember this question. I asked you the question. It says creation 610-2015-140 and 148. That means time, right? Yes. Okay. And you said 141, 148, okay was your answer. And then I said, do you see that? And I said, yeah. And then I said, 
I asked you the question. And then it says below that modification, it says 6-10-2015 for 1631. Mm -hmm. What's the distinction between those two? And do you remember your answer? It's a timestamp error. You need to minus four hours from those timestamp errors. Your answer at the time was, that's a very good question. I can't answer that. And that was back a lot closer in time to what you right. did, right? Right. Because at that time, there wasn't an audit done on the system. And then I asked you the question, you don't know why those numbers are different like that. And you said no. No, I don't. I didn't. And then you also told me that you didn't know who modified it. Isn't that right? Who modified it. If it was at that modified modified what, sir? The document, the input, the information. Oh, well. It was me who would have modified. And how do you know that? Because you didn't even remember actually modifying it first, did you? Objection, Your Honor, compound. Sustained as the compound. When we talked, did you remember at first that you even had modified it? No, I didn't remember. Okay. Because I was very nervous. I understand. I understand. But um, it turns out you did modify it. Yes. Do you know if someone else modified it? You don't know, do you? No. And that modification took place, at least on that exhibit, three, three hours after the original information was put in, right? I do not have the time. I, I don't have. Well, when we were doing the interview, you were looking at the documents, weren't you? Right. And I don't have documents here to go I, over I with you. I understand that. The state didn't give you any documents, did they, today? No. Testimony. No. Right. But nonetheless, at the time, I'd asked you the question, and we were dealing with 140, and then I showed you that the, the difference, the modification took place at 416, which is close to three hours later, right? Yeah. Okay. And so Detective Stone wasn't there anymore when you were modifying it, was he? But at 4, 416. Yes. Are you still talking about the timestamp error? Because yes. if it's 416, then you need to minus four hours, and it's 116. And Detective Stone was still there. I see. So then um, the, the time stone would have been, you need to reduce it back three hours on the first one, too, right? Four, yeah, four, four hours. hours. He was there for four hours with you? Uh, he was there. There's a log from the company from when he came into the building and when he left the building. Um, and you've looked at that since? Looked at what? The log. I know there's a printout. Have I looked at the log? No. Do you, so he came, he came and then he left? Yeah. After three hours or four hours? Do you know? No. He, when he came, we did the first four test fires. He wrapped everything up, took it with him, went to lunch. When he came back after lunch, we did the last one together. He took everything back in his position. I never, uh, possession. I didn't see him. After that second time when he took it back, did you ever see him again? Until no. Until he picked you up at the airport? No, I never saw him again. Then why in the interview did you tell me he came back the next day? Oh, because I've forgotten. At this point, I have forgotten. But you actually told me affirmatively when I was asking you whether or not Detective Stone knew about these images, you actually told me at the time of the interview that yes, because he came back the next day to pick up the images. That's not true, is it? No, actually, if he was there, it would show in the logbook if he was there. Right now, I, I did not see the logbooks. I am nervous. But... You can look at the logbooks and you can see when he came back and in. If I've misspoken, I do apologize. So I understand. Can, can, could you tell me the why, why you told me that he came back the next day if he didn't? Well, being closer in time, he probably did to see the senior scientist, Danny Robert, but not me. So are you saying, are you testifying under oath that he did come back the second day now? I would have to look at the log books for that to. day and the next day in order to affirm that. Okay, and just to kind of wrap this issue up, you don't know at this point, you don't have an independent recollection? No, I okay. would rather have the proof in front of me. I understand. But at the time, you told me when we talked last time that he did come back the next day, right? Objection, and answer. 
a little loud. But at the time, you did tell me he came back the next day, right? I don't remember. Okay. Do you remember this question that I asked you back in the interview? Page 30, line 15, by the way. I look now on the document. It's no proper indication of prior. It's a prior inconsistent statement, Your Honor. You may proceed. I look, on now, look now on that document. It says modification at 5.39 p.m. Was Mr. Stone with you at that time, too? That's an incorrect time. You need to minus four hours from that time. I'm just going to repeat the question I asked. Okay. I look now on the document. It says modification at 5:39:38 p.m. Was Mr. Stone with you at that time too? Your answer was no, probably not. But, and then I asked the question. So how do you know he was? The answer. Your answer was he came back the next. He came back the next day as I printed out stuff. Did you print out stuff the next day? Because that's a. It sounds like an independent memory of seeing him the next day with stuff that had been printed out. Did you do that? Did you do that? Please repeat your question. Sure. In your answer when I asked you this question, so how did you know he was, your answer was he came back the next, he came back the next day as I printed out stuff. So now I'm asking you again, did he come back the next day because you told me you have a memory of him coming back when you were printing stuff out? Did he come back? He must have, sir. What's that? He must have, sir. But I cannot be sure unless I see the log books. I cannot be positive. How many different things did you modify? Oh, just the comments. Sir, the typos, the errors. Well, how many? Can you tell us now what you modified? No, I cannot. There's no record of that. There's, there's no ability to find out what you modified, is there? No, not for the comment section. And are you swearing under oath that everything you modified you did in front of Detective Stone? In front of Detective Stone? Yes. No, but I probably would have told him, look, there was a typo here. But he pointed out to me that his name is spelled wrong. I said, okay, I will correct that. Just a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. No questions, Your Honor. Okay. Any redirect? Sure. Mr. Rosier, um, if some of the timestamps on your reports were inaccurate, does that mean any of the images that you took were inaccurate? Will you like the foundation? Um, will you go ahead and ask some foundational questions? Um, if there was an inaccuracy in the timestamp, um, would you be able to, I mean, how, how would that affect your imaging, the, the actual images that you're taking? It does not affect. Do you, do you review the images that you take after you take them? Well, they show up in the verification screen at the end of the acquisition when the system has stopped. And then I save and close the window field. Um, and would you be able to tell by looking at the images on your screen that there is some kind of inaccuracy in the image? Right, if there was uh, blurry areas. Overall on that. I'm sorry, go ahead. If there was out of focus sections in the mosaic of the surface of the bullet, you could tell there. And then you would know that there's something wrong and you would then restart your acquisition. Um, 
do you take your job seriously? Objection. Relevance beyond scope. I'm going to allow the question. I'm sorry. Yes, I do. Um, do you know whether any of the identifying information about the bullets that you entered into the system was inaccurate? Repeat again, please. When you, when you identified the bullets as exhibit, for example, exhibit one, do you know whether there is any inaccuracy in that identifying information that you entered into the system? No. Bullet one goes with case number three. Um, and did you make sure that every bullet that um, was identified in the computer system um, matched the number that Jeff Stone gave to you? Yes, I did. Do you have any reason at all to skew the results of the imaging for either side in this case? No. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. DeRosier. You're free to go. Thank you. The state may call their next witness. Yes, Your Honor, the state calls Patrick Fernandez. Judge, do I need this? This is all stuff from Jeff Stone. Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth on the penalty of law? I do. Thank you. Nancy. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Patrick Hernandez, H-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-Z. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Tell us, uh, Mr. Hernandez, what was your job on March 16th, 2014? I was employed by the city of Albuquerque, and I was a, as a police officer in the open space division. Are you now retired? Yes, I am. As an open space officer, uh, did your job include uh, patrolling the open space areas of Albuquerque, which it means the, the mesas, the bosque, the foothills and the mountains in general? Yes. Were you one of the two open space officers dispatched out about a call on a person who'd been camping in the open space? Yes, I was. I want to get more information about that specifically in just a minute, but I want to ask you, when you first, as an open space officer, encounter somebody who's camping illegally, and I understand that happens. Quite often, yes. You have a num do you have a number of options on how to handle it? Um. For example, the initial approach, or well, yes, sir. So, do you can you issue a citation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it possible to educate them and tell them, hey, look, you can't camp here? Uh, yes, yes, it is. We also had uh, developed some flyers or some cards um, to educate the person that we did find camping about the uh, ordinances and the laws. All right. Mm -hmm. Is it your experience sometimes people see an open space and think, this is a great spot, I might want to camp out here? 
and that's why you developed these educational pamphlets. I'm gonna um, sustain. Oh, well, good. I'm gonna. It, it seems to be calling for speculation. Oh. talk to you a little bit about your training, Mr. Nandes. As an officer, were you trained in how distance, creating distance, can be a way to protect yourself from somebody who has a knife? Yes. Were you trained about that at the police academy? Yes. Were, did you learn that the further away you are from someone uh, who had a knife, the safer you are? And depending on the, the distance and range, yes. I want to talk to you now more about the specifics of March 16, 2014. Uh, about what time were you dispatched? It was uh, towards the beginning of my shift. I don't recall exactly what time. Was it about four? Four, yes, I believe so. When you first arrived, did you make contact with a gentleman named Mr. Alexander Fixton? Uh, I believe that was his name. He was the one who placed the call in. He was the person that lived at a home at 812 Piedra Vista Northeast, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. When you first encountered Mr. Thixton, uh, did Officer McDaniel attempt to get close to him and pat him down? Um, at the residence of the, on, uh, no. Did did you or Officer McDaniel draw your weapons on him? On relevance. It's how how they encountered the first person. Did either you or Officer McDaniel uh, draw your weapon on Mr. Thixton when you arrived that day? No. Did you know whether or not Mr. Thixton was armed? Did you know? I'm going to sustain the objection. Was he armed? Was Mr. Thixton armed? No. You were not aware that he had a pistol? Well, it's asked and answered. Move on, please. After meeting with Mr. Fixton, did you, uh, or did Mr. Fixton uh, advise you and Officer McDaniel of where this camp was located? Yes. How did you get there? We first went into Mr. Fixton's backyard where he pointed out the location of the camp and then uh, we got into our patrol units and drove around to a trailhead at the end of copper at the east end of copper to access the trails and then did you walk up yes we walked up mm -hmm. when you got there uh, what did you observe did you see a shelter uh, first we noticed the outcropping of rocks and uh, that was it, and as we made our way up around, we did notice a lot of uh, garbage and trash in, a, um, in the area, which did uh, indicate that possibly someone might have been uh, okay. in that area. Did you notice a shelter? I noticed the... Uh, did you notice? And, and I just want to make sure I understand, you, was your answer that you did not see a shelter? And no. Nope. Okay. 
sustain objection. I you're sustain right. the objection. Okay, may I approach? No. Oh, the witness or the court? The court. No. All right. Uh, Officer Hernandez, uh, when was the first time you gave a statement about this uh, interaction with Mr. Boyd? That night. March 16, 2014. Yes. At that time, did you advise that you'd seen a shelter when you were approached? Oh, yes. I'll roll. Um, I don't recall on that. Would it refresh your recollection to review your statement, sir? Yes. And when you're reviewing the statement, just read it to yourself, not out loud. <clears throat> Can you indicate page and line for counsel yeah, when you I'm find it? Yeah, I'm trying to find it. I think I pulled the wrong part. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to that one. All right. When you and Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Officer McDaniel approached uh, Mr. Boyd's tent or the camping area that Mr. Thixon had shown you, uh, How long did it take when you first encountered him before you and Officer McDaniel drew your weapons? Um, can you repeat the question? Just to yes, clarify sir. it. Sure. Mm -hmm. When you and Officer McDaniel went up to Mr. Boyd's camp, did you? How long did it take before you drew your weapons? Uh, possibly um, after giving him commands to show his hands and him not doing so probably about anywhere from uh, 20 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And would it refresh your like, or recollection or, or help you to look at the actual video about how long it took? Sustained. Was it your recollection that you pulled, you said, I heard you say that because he wouldn't show you your hand, his hands, is that right? Yes. All right, I'd like to play that. And this is what's already been uh, admitted as states 7B. I'm sorry, was that B or D? B. D as in boy? Yes. So let's get those markings off. And let's look at the and time how long it takes. Why don't you start? Go ahead and come out. Yeah. Sergeant Pinky, please. Hey, did you see? Can you see your hand? 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 Okay. Is it about 11 seconds? So, yeah, it says 13 on there. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. And when he first was asked to show his hands, what did he say to you? Did you say, what's that, officer? Yes. Um, the first question was appropriate. The second half was not. So sustained with regard to the second half. What did he say when, you first, when he was first asked to show his hands? According to the video, um, he said, what's that, officer? And does that indicate to you that he didn't hear the, the statement? Yes, that's why it was repeated. <laughs> when 
Mr. Boyd came out of his shelter, uh, did you then see a knife on his uh, belt? Just in his pocket. Sustained as to leading. What did you see in his pocket? After some time, after Mr. Boyd came out of the shelter, um, we were going to, as we were patting him down for possible, any possible weapons, we, I did notice a, uh, a knife in his right front pocket clipped onto his pocket. Is it your testimony that you did not see the knife until you started patting him down? When he stood up. I didn't pat him down. Yes, sir. Did mm -hmm. you see the knife, and I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that you saw the knife when he Objection. stood up Overruled. and came out toward you? Is that right? Yes. After you asked him to come out? Yes. And is there anything illegal about camping with a knife? No. Is it there anything illegal about having a knife? No. Is there anything illegal about having two knives? No. And when he came out, Officer McDaniel, uh, then what happened? Officer McDaniel spoke with him and asked him to turn around so he could pat him down. Okay. And I'm going to play the video for you of 7B. Before well, we get that ready, when <coughs> Mr. Boyd came out of the tent, did he have anything in his hand? No. Go ahead and come out. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. Okay, let's we'll pull him out here. Now come out. We're really going to be camping out here. Come out now, Albuquerque State Spike. Why are you raising weapons? Come out now, please. Why are you raising weapons? Do not raise. Is this going to be your hand? No. Okay. I've been calling y'all for five months, okay? Okay. And nobody's responding. All right, now do me a favor. I have a seat right over there. Do me a favor, but I have... Was the first, was, was what he had told the scene, do me a favor, and have a seat? Is that what Mr. Boyd was told? That's what it said in the video, yes. Was he walking over to go have a seat? I don't know. I don't know what to do. We don't feel too tight. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn around, turn around, turn around, I'm gonna pack you down. Is that what you are referring to when you say Officer McDaniel has asked him to turn around? Yes. And when, uh, what happened when Officer McDaniel went to pack him down? I did um, inform Officer McDaniel of what I saw. As for officer safety reasons, a knife in his right front pocket. And when Officer McDaniel went to pat uh, Mr. Boyd down, what did he say? Turn Mr. around. Mr. What did Mr. Boyd say? I don't recall. Let's watch that again. Drop him up. I down. Just finish it back. Turn around. Turn around. Drop the knife! Drop the knife! I raised. Is it going to be your hand? No. Okay. So, I've been calling y'all for five months. Okay? Okay. And nobody's responding. All right, now do me a favor. I have a seat right over there. I'll do you a favor, but I have... So, I don't know what to do. Please don't tell people. No, I'm going to... Does that refresh your recollection of what he said? What Boyd said? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, please don't touch me. Mr. Uh, Officer McDaniel went to frisk him anyway, is that right? He went to pat him down, correct. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? During that time, I advised Officer McDaniel that there was a knife in Mr. Boyd's right front pocket. Okay. Did he take out those knives, Mr. At, Boyd? At that time, Mr. Boyd took out two knives, one from his right and I assume the one from his left pocket at the same time and opened them up. What did you do when you pulled out the knives? Mr. Boyd turned around and turned, opened the knives and pointed them at myself and Officer McDaniel in a threatening manner. I immediately told him to drop the knives and, and pointed my weapon at him. Did you also scoot back? Yes. Was that 
Would that be some of your training to create distance? Yes. Were you safe? No. Okay. Did he stab you? No. Right. Did you did not shoot him? No. All right. Now, were you at that point after about five or ten minutes? Were uh, did Mr. Boyd put his knives away? After about five to ten minutes yes. during the, that process, the knives were in his pocket and out of his pocket and several times. After about five to ten minutes, though, did he put them back in his pocket? In and out at the times, so yes. Mm -hmm. Were you able to keep Mr. Boyd calm until backup arrived? I was able to have a dialogue with him, yes. Mm -hmm. Did backup include a CIT officer? Objection. Well, who in the backup arrived? Who for backup arrived? Uh, Foothills units. Who was involved? Who, who, what were the specialties of the individuals or who arrived? Uh, I know one was a sergeant and the other were field officers. Were any of them CIT officers? I didn't know at the time. Did you give a statement we talked about it earlier the night of the shooting? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to review that statement about who arrived? Yes. Page 7, line 10, counsel. And I'll ask you about it after you've had a chance to read it. Go start from 10 and go down to the highlighted mark. Yes. Did in fact a CIT officer arrive? Yes. What is a CIT officer? Critical incident training trained officer. Oh, right. mm -hmm. Do they have specialized training in dealing with mentally ill individuals? Yes. When backup arrived, were there any any, any individuals who arrived with beanbag beanbag shotguns? Yes. Did the CIT officer uh, have a good rapport with Mr. Boyd? He established a dialogue with him. Did he also establish a good rapport with him? He was able to communicate with him, I'm not too sure. Would it refresh yeah. your recollection to review what you said the night of the incident? Sure. Do that. Sorry. I'm sorry, which line was it? I'm sorry. Uh, 14 through 17. Okay. Yeah, thank you. The night of the shooting, did you believe that the CIT officer had developed a good rapport with Mr. Boyd? Yes. to when you first, when Mr. Boyd first pulled out the knives um, at the pat-down attempt. How close were you to Mr. Boyd before you created distance and he pulled out the knives? Five to six feet. All right. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the video. Um, because is this Officer McDaniel that we see right here? That's the shadow, or is that you? I believe that's Officer McDaniel. I had a hat on that day. And are you this shadow right here to the left? No. All right. So how close was Officer McDaniel to Mr. Boyd when he pulled out the knife? Uh, two to three feet. And was he stabbed or cut in any way? No. After uh, tactical officers arrived, where were you directed to go? Or did no. you stay at the scene? That was, it's, uh, I was at the scene of, um, can you give me a better time frame of that because a lot had happened 
sure. transpired in that. Yeah. yeah. Let's look at what's been admitted as state's exhibit. which is a photograph of the area. I'm going to first show the jury what I'm showing you, and then I'll show you. Um, so we have Mr. Boyd is right here on this exhibit. I'm about to ask a question. <laughs> That's fine, but I don't think that council can see, so you can oh. move so you can see. All right. At some point, did you move away from this area to establish, help establish a perimeter? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is a perimeter? A perimeter? Yes. It's just a, um, a safety uh, line to prevent any type of uh, unwanted um, uh, I guess uh, a safety line to prevent any type of outside um, problems from coming into the scene. So it prevents people from coming in. Does it also prevent people from going out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where, when you went to help maintain a perimeter, where did you go? Let's see if you can show us here. Have you? Sorry, Councilman, I'm going to go back around. Uh, once you went to maintain it, help maintain a perimeter, where did you go? Here's I went down here on to the road over here to the right. Where it says mm -hmm. Patrick Hernandez. Yes, P. Hernandez. Right. I'm going to stand back here so the jury can see where you went to Yes, I can. All right, was it right I was down at that location you had just previously pointed out, sitting in my patrol unit. We talked earlier, Mr. Hernandez, about the fact that Mr. Boyd pulled out his knives when Officer McDaniel uh, attempted to pat him down. Is that right? Yes. Why didn't you shoot him then? I created distance, which was another option. Good morning, Officer Hernandez. Good morning. Now, the state didn't spend much time establishing who you are and your experience in law enforcement, and I'd like to do that. Where were you born? Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I understand that you spent some time in Hawaii, is that right? Yes, sir. And, and how did that happen? Um, after college, I um, spent a lot of time in Hawaii. Um, spent about a year there living. And just recently, I've uh, moved, been um, able to move back to Hawaii and uh, I do training um, for Honolulu PD and Honolulu uh, EMS and fire out there. So let's go back. You mentioned that you attended college. Is that right? You attended college? Here? Yes, sir. What college did you attend? New Mexico State. And what degree did you receive? Um, associate in Criminal Justice. Okay. After receiving your Associates in Criminal Justice, mm -hmm. how did you find your way into the Open Space Police? I did 10 years at Las Cruces PD, and then uh, we moved to Albuquerque um, 
midway through my career so my wife could uh, attend UNM. So when you say you worked 10 years at, at Las Cruces PD, is it correct to say that you were a law enforcement officer, police officer with the Las Cruces Police Department? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you and and in order to work as a Las Cruces Police Department officer, which academy or law enforcement academy did you attend? The Southern New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy in Las Cruces. And is it correct to say after attending the that law enforcement academy, you became certified by the New Mexico Department of Public Safety to work as a law enforcement officer in the state? Yes. So you spent 10 years as a police officer in the Las Cruces Police Department. Yes. Is that right? And then you joined the Open Space Police, is that correct? Correct. Why did you choose the Open Space Police? It uh, was something more aligned with um, my, um, say, uh, expertise with community relations, um, and uh, it fit me better than uh, going to directly to the PD, which, um, if I can get into the sure. whole story, is it? My wife was uh, moving up here so she could go to medical school. And after that, um, we had three small kids also, children, at home. And I didn't have time to go through a academy, a lateral academy for APD, and open space was hiring. And uh, it fit me well. The position fit my, um, my expertise well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, would you please explain to us how the work of an open space officer might differ from an officer, a field services officer who works with the Albuquerque Police Department. The open space also uh, at that time was a different department and a different um, chain of command from chief on down at, when I was hired there. So was it, is it fair to say that there was a time when the open space police were not part of the Albuquerque Police Department like they are now? Yes. So the city of Albuquerque ran or essentially operated two separate police departments, one being the Open Space Police and the other being the Albuquerque Police Department. Yes. And that's mm -hmm. the way that the Open Space Police uh, was, in, was in operation in 2014, is that right? Yes, similar to uh, what the airport police are currently right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I interrupted you. You, you were talking, mm -hmm. I had asked you about the differences between being an Open Space mm -hmm. Officer and a uh, field services officer with the Albuquerque Police Department. Would you please tell this jury how your job differed? Okay. My job was, as an open space police officer, was to maintain and uh, manage and patrol the areas in and around the incorporated uh, areas of Albuquerque, um, being the West Mesa open space area, volcanoes, um, the Bosque through the Rio Grande, uh, 18 miles from reservation to reservation, going from north to south, and also the foothills of Albuquerque and many properties within the East Mountain area also. So would you please explain to the jury, based on your experience working in the open space in the foothills, what that particular park is? What is that park? The open space, yes. um, it's, the open space park is managed by the city of Albuquerque for recreational purposes, um, for hiking, mountain biking, um, and many other um, activities out there. Now, focusing in on that area where the UMAM is located, where the incident happened with Mr. Boyd, is there a particular name for that area? Uh, it's called the uh, Copper Open Space Area. Um, that's what we referred it to, because being at the end of the Copper, Copper Road, where the trailhead is. Mm -hmm. Now, based on your experience working in the Copperhead area, mm -hmm. how frequently is this er or this particular area of the park visited by citizens of the city? Well, it's very, uh, it's frequently, fr frequently visited many times throughout the, the day during the opening and closing of the park. Okay. So when you say opening and closing of mm -hmm. the park, would you please explain to the jury the, uh, the hours of operation of mm -hmm. this park, when you can be there and when you can't? Okay. Um, it's been a while, but we do um, close the park gates at 9 p.m. That was part of our uh, daily duties, um, 9 to 10 p.m., depending on when the hours of uh, daylight savings time or sundown was. We would uh, go and close the gates for the park. Now, you talked about it being a park. Is it fair to say that an open space area is much like a park that's contained within the city limits that you know we traditionally know having a sidewalk and grass? Yes. 
What about the issue of camping? Um, how does someone obtain permission from the city of Albuquerque to camp in the open space? Uh, you have to go through uh, the civilian side of open space management, um, which would uh, be also the Parks and Recreation Department. And you'd have to go in there and apply for a, uh, a permit to have for any type of special use in any of the open space lands. In your experience, how frequently did open space allow people to simply camp in that area of Copper Hitch Bay? Uh, the 10 years I was there, n I never. Now, during the course of this incident, did you ever come to learn whether Mr. Boyd had obtained a permit to camp in the open space? Can you repeat the question, sir? During, uh, have you come to learn whether Mr. Boyd had obtained a permit to camp in the open space? No, I, I was not aware of uh, Mr. Boyd having a, a, a permit. Now, we talked about the uses of the open space. You had mentioned mountain biking, is that right? Correct. And you mentioned simply hiking, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you would agree with me that there is essentially an access road that runs in between the U-Mount and the residential, you know, the residences that are adjacent to the open space, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you would agree with me that that is frequent, frequented by bike, uh, by joggers and by walkers, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You would agree with me that the Copperhead uh, Trail it was, had a lot of traffic, is that right? Yes, it did. And it was a very popular destination for folks who lived in the adjoining area. In and around the city, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, we talk about the open space, but you would, would you agree with me that the open space is immediately adjacent to or next to a neighborhood? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that neighborhood, having traveled through it in, uh, you know, in, in the years that you went out to the Copperhead Trail area? Uh, upper middle class uh, neighborhood. Um, just your typical um, neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You would agree with me that there are single family homes along the open space? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's dense, and, and these homes are one after another, is that right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. It's not just simply a house here and there, there's just simply every lot has a house. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the incident at hand and, and walk you through uh, your arrival. Now I understand that you and Officer McDaniel were dispatched to this location. Yes, correct. correct. Mm -hmm. And that happened at approximately 4.30 p.m., is that fair to say? Yes. Mm -hmm. And shortly after being informed uh, that you were being dispatched, you learned that you were there to investigate a homeless camp. Does that sound about right? Yes. Now, how frequently in your career do you investigate incidents involving the homeless? Uh, during my time in open space, about several times a week. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why, why do open space officers end up addressing issues involving the homeless? Due to the, the, uh, the region that we patrol, is, it's off the beaten path. It's not very... Um, more places to basically hide um, and not be seen by the public, um, by the homeless. Now you had mentioned that in the three, you know, every three or four, every three or four times a week, is that mm -hmm. about the frequency that you would address issues involving the homeless on the open space? Yeah, throughout the city, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, in your experience in dealing with the homeless, did you have a sense for, you know, how your interactions would generally go? Yes, oh yes. Mm -hmm. well, how, in your experience, how would those interactions with the gen homeless generally go? We immediately notify ourselves as an Albuquerque police officer to establish ourselves with communicating with the subject. Now why did you say Albuquerque police as opposed to open space police? It's uh, the department that we were under at that time. And okay. mm -hmm. Now I had interrupted you and you were talking about uh, essentially your experience in dealing with the homeless. Mm -hmm. how, would those, uh, how would those encounters generally go for you? Uh, very smoothly and uh, depending on the the individual we encountered. How frequently did you uh, have to address the issue of the homeless camping, trespassing mm -hmm. on city parks or city open space? 
um, quite often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how would you generally resolve those types of encounters when the homeless were there camping or trespassing mm -hmm. on city open space? Uh, we would uh, attempt to well, we would educate the homeless person that saying that you cannot. It's against city ordinance to be camping here in the open space, and we would assist the the uh, homeless person by re with removing his camp sometimes, uh, getting some help, some resources also, to find a place to uh, stay. Would it be fair to say that in your general experience in dealing with the homeless who are trespassing in the city open space, that you would work with them to actually help them leave the open space and find resources in the community? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how often did you ever cite a homeless person for uh, uh, trespassing on the city open space? Uh, not very often. Only with uh, possible repeat offenders that we'd come across several times. We'd try to give them a verbal a warning about and educate them on the, the ordinance of illegal camping in the open space. Now, when you encountered a homeless person who was there without a permit, how would you go about essentially helping them leave, what would be that process? Well, we'd stand by while they were packing up uh, their goods and their belongings and, uh, and, and, help, and picking up the trash also. And uh, we'd escort him uh, to the outskirts of open space area. Um, or we could also contact uh, resources for the homeless, offer him a ride. Um, sometimes we'd offer, have a, uh, a homeless organization that would help the homeless you know, come pick them up. Okay. Now, as you approach this particular call involving Mr. Boyd and knowing that there, there was an individual who was apparently camping out in the open space, was that, the, was that in your mind as to how you were going to handle the incident with Mr. Boyd? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you arrived on scene, uh, you and Officer McDaniel, Almost uh, at 5 o'clock, is that fair to say? Yes. Officer McDaniel was the primary officer on the call. Yes. And at that time, you would agree with me that for, for, for reasons of scheduling and things of that nature, Officer McDaniel was the acting sergeant for your unit. Yes, he was. Now, I failed to ask you, at this point in your career, how many years had you been a law enforcement officer? Uh, close to 20. And I failed to follow up about your work with the Honolulu PD. How did you end up training the, with the Honolulu PD, and what do you train them in? Well, um, I am a member of the International Police Mountain Bike Association, and I'm a uh, instructor trainer for that organization. And uh, I was able to, well, they, the association had contacted me about an interest of possibly training Honolulu PD on that uh, on the uh, police mountain biking. They were in need of some training and uh, reestablishing their, um, their program out there. So I was, I was able to help them out in that. So it's for, correct to say that you worked as a certified law enforcement officer in New Mexico for 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's when you retired, is that right? Yes. And then you took take on, I guess, a second career, being a trainer for the Honolulu Police Department. I, I contract out with them, yes, okay. correct, yeah, my services. Mm -hmm. And how many years have you been doing that? Uh, I did it uh, in 2015, and then also just recently, uh, last month I was in Honolulu with Honolulu EMS, the fire division of it, the fire okay. department division. What do you teach the Honolulu EMS and fire department? Uh, again, uh, international police mountain biking, uh, basic public safety cycling. Now, turning your attention back to this incident, now, you made contact with Mr. Fixton, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you were asked questions about how you treated Mr. Fixton, is that correct? During yes. direct examination. Would you please describe to the jury Mr. Fixton, how he presented himself, and how he interacted with you so the jury would have a sense for mm -hmm. why you treated him the way that you did? Yes, as we arrived to Mr. Fixton's house. Uh, I do recall him waving us down and stepping outside the door. I also noticed that he had several large dogs in his house, a couple of Great Danes. Uh, we, and I uh, spoke with Mr. Thixons about that because I also have uh, Great Danes. And uh, we established a, uh, 
a nice rapport and communication. Is it fair to say that Mr. Thixton sought you out? Yes. He waved you down? Yes. And he was friendly? Yes. And you would agree with me that, uh, in your experience, that a citizen who waves you down and is friendly, that you're, you know, you're, you, that essentially, yet your officer safety concerns are at a very low level. Correct. You did not perceive a threat from Mr. Thixton. Correct. So when the state asked you if you drew your weapon on Mr. Thixton, you would agree with me that was a strange question to ask. Yes. Mr. Thixton was the calling party. Yes. And Mr. Thixton wanted you all there to help him uh, address a problem as he perceived it. Yes. And he was very cooperative. Yes. And you even had uh, a back and forth about great games because you and Mr. Thixton owned great games. Correct. So you mm -hmm. would agree with me that this was a very civil, a very pleasant encounter with a citizen of the city of Albuquerque. Yes, it's a regular daily encounter, yes. Now, you were there to investigate uh, misdemeanor criminal activity, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in the course of talking with Mr. Thixton, you found out more information about what was happening about approximately 100 yards, uh, I guess, uh, away from his house? Yes. Mm -hmm. What did Mr. Thixton tell you about what was happening behind his house? Uh, Mr. Thixon informed us that uh, there is a, um, a, legal, uh, a camp, homeless campsite uh, behind his home for several weeks. And uh, he had called previously before that, I believe, but uh, nothing, had, nothing had been located or found um, at that time. And then um, he w walked us to his backyard to uh, point out the uh, location. Yeah, it, to give us a better perspective on it. Now, I understand that you initially did not depart from Mr. Thixton's backyard and walk directly to Mr. Boyd's camp, is that right? Correct. Why did you choose to approach Mr. Boyd's camp from a location different than Mr. Thixton's backyard? Um, there was, uh, we'd have to jump a fence and go through uh, the area, the open space area, there was no trails on, and we'd have to walk around bushes and cactuses. It's just easier to go to the trailhead, which is very close to the area. Okay. Now, by approaching the trailhead, you would agree with me that that prevented Mr. Boyd or anyone who was watching from making an assess uh, a determination that Mr. Thixton was the complaining party. Yes, possible to. And that by approaching from a location that was different from the calling party, you could essentially arrive at the location without having made the complaint about Mr. Boyd. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you were trying to ensure a little bit of safety for Mr. Uh, Thixton by taking a different approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you went to the Copperhead Trail and walked on a, and a very large service road that leads up to the area. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. and, and you can... You're not in any way concealed or, or have anything to prevent someone who's looking at you from seeing you, right? Correct. That part of the open space is open. You yes. can be seen as you're walking up. Is that fair? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if Mr. Boyd had been looking, you would agree with me that as you walked up, you were clearly visible and there were no obstructions that prevented you from being seen. Correct. You were not there to surprise Mr. Boyd. You were there and approached openly. Is that right? Yes, we did. Now, you weren't asked about the uniform you were wearing that day. Would you please describe to the jury the uniform you had on? Yeah, the uniform I had on was approved by the Albuquerque Police Department. It was more of a lightweight um, type of a uniform, a polo with a breathable fabric with a sewn-on Albuquerque PD patch, badge patch, and uh, shoulder patch. Now, would you agree with me that the markings you had on you, the shoulder patch, the badge, identified you as a law enforcement officer? Yes, I also had a hat with a sewn on patch. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your equipment, what equipment did you have on your person? I had the standard uh, Albuquerque uh, field officer equipment, which it consisted of a uh, Sam Brown belt to hold um, my service weapon, um, other tools that I might need, my handcuffs, and, and so forth. 
Now, as you approached Mr. Boyd, what efforts, if any, did you make to try and conceal your approach from Mr. Boyd? None other than uh, to approach the camp, we did have to uh, climb a uh, outcropping of rocks, in which the only way to approach that camp it was the only way we could do it to kind of put us out of view for a moment. Okay. Now, in your experience, how do you approach the homeless and, and, and interact with them? What is that? Are you taught that there's a particular approach to take with them? Yeah, just again, um, the approach we would normally take would just be to communicate with the, verbally communicate with the, the individual by, by announcing who we were. Mm -hmm. Now, at this time, Your Honor, I would like to play the uh, encounter that was recorded on uh, states, or I should say, Officer Pettis' exhibit B1, B1A. And I'm going to play from zero to three minutes and one, three minutes and one second, and then have the transcript, which is exhibit D3, and that would be from page two, line one, to page seven, line two. I didn't um, follow with the exhibit letter for the transcript. Is that D? Yes, yes. And it was D1A or B? So B1A, so the the first of the three McDaniel videos, and then the transcript would be D3, which is the transcript of Exhibit B1. Any objections? Now there's some time that goes on before the audio turns on. Is that right? Yes. And that's how these devices work. We turn them on, they record video before you hear sound. Correct. And this is, of course, your approach up to the camp. Yes. You have no weapons drawn, is that right? Correct. You're walking with your hands uh, without weapons. Yes. And the same could be said with Officer McDaniel. Yes. You just sit. <laughs> Come out. What's that? Call the picket police. Hey, did you see your hands? Can you shut up? Can you see your hands? Can you see your hands? Okay, we'll pull them out here. Now come out. It's illegal to be camping out here. Come out now. Albuquerque Police Department. Why are you raising weapons to the Come out now, please. Why are you raising weapons to the not raise. Because we couldn't see your hands. Look. Okay. I've been calling y'all for five months. Okay. Okay. Nobody's response. All right. Now do me a favor. Have a seat right over there. Do you a favor, but I have. Okay, I'm not in national security. Please don't touch me. No, I'm gonna. I'm getting. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. I'm gonna pat you down. Just get that. Hey. No. Turn around. Turn around. Drop the knife. Drop the knife. Drop the knife, please. Drop the knife. 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 Oh shit, dude. Come on. Drop the knife. Economic warfare. Economic warfare. Drop the knife. National security on my hand. Drop the knife. What type of security is that? Two million dollars. What type of security? You're taking this from me or this country. What type of security is that? Drop your knife. I notified the police for five months. Okay, what about what? 15, 25, 30. Okay, keep your hands out of your pocket. I'm always going to use you. Okay. There's a nice pressure at the end of the pocket. Trail hit. Put the little north. Put the knife down. I'm not putting you. Okay, no, okay. Put the knife down. Don't correct me again. You do not give the Department of Defense direction. I'm just giving you a phone line. I'm going to add the I'm not putting this over to you, give this back to you. It's an 82. Okay. 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 1525 PD. 1520 Adam PD. Send them to the address that they're sent to and they can go to their backyard. It's not an address. It's a public court. Okay. Goddamn it. I had a fucking address. I'm going to give you my 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 address. I'm going to give you
the world of future but I'm not saying to jail tonight. You might. Okay. No, nobody's going to jail. Nobody says going to jail. Right. Okay? You want to leave? Hey, no, no, no. Just stay right there. You would agree with me that when you reached this, uh, the top of the, the, you found a male uh, inside of a, uh, inside of a, uh, an area of rocks. Is that right? Yes. And that <clears throat> person uh, you later came to know uh, was James Boyd. Yes. Now he was awake when you approached. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. Now, when you approach, you would agree with me that the first words that Officer McDaniel said are, "How you do?" Yes. And it was said in a friendly, professional tone. Yes. And that's how you generally approach a homeless person who is out in the open space. Yes. You don't simply order them. You introduce yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what you did. That's what we did, yes. Now, what, why is it important for a police officer to see a, a suspect's hands? When we're trained in the academy, that's what we're trained to see the hands, that's what can possibly harm, injure, or kill you, the hands. Now, when you didn't see the hands, what was your response? We asked him to show, him our, show us his hands. And how quick did, was Mr. Boyd uh, to show you his hands? Not quick. In your experience, when someone doesn't immediately do what you ask, what concerns does it raise for off in, with regards to officer safety? He could possibly be concealing a weapon. Okay. Now, the weapons were eventually drawn, is that correct? The knives, yes. Mm -hmm. I should say, I should say. Mm -hmm. Eventually, um, you and Officer McDaniel drew your firearms, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to draw your firearms? We, I drew my firearm to the low ready position when Mr. Boyd would not show us his hands and, and refused to do so. So when you say low ready, is it fair to say that you were, in a, you, know, you were standing and that you were pointing your weapon into the ground? Correct. And when you have your weapon at the low ready, you're preparing yourself to, for using it, but you were in no way aiming or pointing your weapon at the person who's posing a threat. Correct. It's simply a precautionary measure that you take that gives you the ability to more quickly react if the need arises to use deadly force than if you had a weapon in your holster. That's the training, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that the reason an officer places their weapon at the low ready is that you perceive the threat when Mr. Boyd was unwilling to show his hands in what you would think would be a reasonable amount of time. Correct. Now, when Mr. Boyd is asked to come out, you agree with me that that was said in a friendly and professional tone? Yes. Mm -hmm. You were there to investigate uh, suspected criminal activity? Yes. And in the 10 years you've been working in the open space, you have never found that the open space had given anyone a permit to, to camp in that particular area? Correct. So the likelihood that Mr. Boyd had a permit was very low? Yes. Now, you asked him uh, to come out. Why did you ask Mr. Boyd to come out? He was stuffed between his belongings, for lack of a better word. Um, it was a, a large pile of uh, clothes, um, possible sleeping bag, bags, grocery bags, uh, plastic tarps, and so forth. Now, why? For officer safety reasons, why would you want to separate a person from their belongings? It had been my experience that, uh, especially with homeless camps, that there is a weapon usually involved with a homeless camp. Now, in your experience, how often did you find that the homeless were armed with a weapon of some type? Um, a we it we could be considered a weapon at uh, edge not.
I did notice it's we're trained to visually inspect the individual we're speaking with for any bulges or possible pocket knives that are clipped on their pockets. Now, why did you tell Officer McDaniel that you saw him? For officer safety reasons. So he had, in, just in case he had missed it, I wanted to make sure that he was aware of it. Now, upon, immediately upon seeing a knife, what steps are you trained to take next in order to ensure your safety? At that time, we were, we're trained to pat down the individual by uh, placing his hands behind his head and then removing that object from the immediate